in Glastonbury Romance again and again that he goes into the peak experience. That simply looking at something, particularly something like, say, water gathered in the hollow of a leaf or something of the sort, can immediately suddenly draw in his whole being in fascination at what he's looking at, and he goes into the peak experience. He didn't call them peak experiences, but this is clearly the secret of the kind of thing he did. Now, the interesting thing about Wolf Solent is that Wolf is, in a certain sense, um, such a, a negative person. He tends to see himself as a failure, and the result is that at the end of the book, as you remember, he decides to commit suicide by flinging himself into Lenty Pond. And then again, with this peculiar ability which he has to get, so to speak, inside things, he is suddenly able to see himself, so to speak, at the bottom of Lenty Pond and realize what it w would really be like. And then his whole body revolts against this idea. And at that moment, um, he seems to feel a kind of revelation and decides that, of course, he doesn't want to die. And he suddenly sees, as Graham Greene did after he'd done the Russian roulette, that, in fact, everything is good. Dostoevsky said the same thing after he'd been stood in front of a firing squad and then reprieved at the last minute, that suddenly everything seemed absolutely glorious. Now, the interesting thing is that Wolf, at that point, um, decides that everything is beautiful and that all that he has to do is, as it were, merely to live his ordinary everyday life with that feeling of, you know, how, what a relief it is to live your ordinary everyday life, as Graham Greene would have done after the Russian roulette and as Dostoevsky would have done after being reprieved from the firing squad. And it's from then on, this point at which Wolfe decides um, that he will accept ordinary everyday life, that you remember he walks in a field of buttercups and is able for the first time to absolutely completely, so to speak, enter into the buttercups. Until then, he's been a sort of rather subjective sort of person descending inside himself. And Poe says that his ability to mythologize um, disappears at a certain point where he's actually talking to Christie in one of the later chapters. And, uh, of course, Peirce is here wrong. Um, the ability to mythologize doesn't disappear. It doesn't go away. It may go away for a time, like a dark night of the soul, but it doesn't go away for good. It will always come back again. And if Wolf once had it, then he's going to have it later. So that part of the book is completely unconvincing. But the fact remains that what is interesting is that Wolf finishes the book in what you might call a completely objective, non-subjective state of mind. And it was from then on that Poets went on to write Glastonbury Romance. That he himself had projected himself into this completely objective state of mind in which he could get so much pleasure simply from looking at nature and also from other people. And of course you notice the fact that um, he wrote about all this um, from America with a tremendous feeling of nostalgia. Uh, I myself once took Glastonbury Romance with me when I had to um, teach at a college in Dea in Mallorca for a winter and read it through with enormous pleasure simply because it took me back to England, so to speak. This is again uh, something which is tremendously important. Um, you see, when um, you are concentrating upon one single thing, you know, let's say eating your breakfast or whatever, you might say that you were in mono-consciousness. You were simply focused upon one single thing. Now, if um, while that hap happens, a tune comes on the radio that suddenly reminds you of a time in your own past. You were suddenly in two places at once. You were not only sitting eating a breakfast, but you were elsewhere. And this produces in you a peak experience, being in two places at once, which I call duo-consciousness. And it's this duo-consciousness that Poets has a sort of natural ability to conjure up. And it's duo-consciousness that makes Glastonbury Romance a great novel. Um, what amazed me as I read it was simply his ability to move so completely inside other people. There are very few novels that do this. One of the few, by the way, is a novel by Kazantzakis called Freedom and Death, um, which also takes um, the town of Heraklion in Greece and moves around from character to character. And of course, uh, Dylan Thomas's Under Milk Wood has this um, to a large extent too. The strange ability to leave behind your own sort of silly little subjectivity and just to get out there into the sort of really big world that exists, the Graham Greene trick. 
Now, the interesting thing is that Poes started off as a very subjective kind of poet when he uh, left Cambridge. Um, he said how deeply he was influenced by Yeats's early poems, which, as you know, um, are total sort of escapist romantic, wanting to get away into a sort of fairyland, away from this harsh real world. And uh, Percy himself was obviously that kind of a person. Now, what actually turned Yeats um, into the person he became, the great poet, was in fact going to America to lecture. And he found lecturing in America such hard work. He didn't have any time to sit around a moon and allow himself to get into these curious states of sort of boredom and so on. And masturbation too, by the way. Um, Yeats describes in the first version of the autobiography that he spent so much time masturbating he used to go around in a total state of exhaustion. So, uh, of course, Post did the same where traveling is concerned. I mean, I know this, you see, I've done it too. I've had to go to the States and wander all over the place lecturing. But of course, I did it by airplane. Post had these nice long periods in between where he could sit on a train and get from one place to another. What was happening to me was that I would get on a campus at, say, 10 o'clock in the morning and um, be shown to my room and told um, that, you know, if I felt like it, one of the professors was having a seminar and would I like to sit in on it at 11 in the morning. Then I had my lunch. Then in the afternoon, I got dragged along to some other seminar. Then at 6 in the evening, I got taken along to a faculty party given for me in which everybody in turn said, um, oh, well, where have you been so far? Where are you going to next? What do you think of America? And then the next faculty wife again came along and said, where have you been? So and so it went on. Uh, by the time you'd finished this and you went and gave your lecture, you were sort of pretty well whacked. Then a few students would say, would you like to come downtown and have a drink? And you feel that you really should do this because they'd like you to do it. And so you get into bed at 2 in the morning. And then the caretaker shakes you awake at 7 the next morning. And you clamber into a car and go on to the next airport and are at a new university by 10 the next morning. Well, you just imagine doing 12 weeks of that. I mean, I, I, I came back to England a zombie. But it did nevertheless teach me um, that uh, this business of being an outsider is all very well. But the ability to just do sheer hard grind is the important thing. And this is what Yeats learned. This is what turned Yeats into the poet he became, just hard work. And this is also what turned Poes into the sort of writer he became. This is the reason that he became a great writer. You generate an enormous strength, what Gurdjieff called essence, um, by any kind of long concentration, painful concentration. Uh, Gurdjieff talked about it as intentional suffering. And he said the person who contained most essence that he'd ever met was a Corsican brigand who had achieved this by peering down the sights of a rifle all day in the boiling hot sun. And that uh, this had given him essence. Well, that's what you do. You take on something that's going to cause you a great deal of trouble, but it's the only way of growing internally. And most people never grow internally simply because um, their lives, as our lives are in a modern civilization, moderately comfortable. There's nothing to force us to do these things. I've been fairly lucky in a sense because I've been so broke all my life. I've never been out of overdraft that I've been forced to write book after book after book after book. This is why I've done a hundred books. Just, you know, to support my family. And uh, doing this has at least <laughs> been a kind of spiritual discipline, if you want to call it that. Now, for me, the interesting thing about Poes is that when he came back to England and proceeded to write Maiden Castle, you immediately notice that that sort of wonderful feeling that you've got in Wolf Solent and Glastonbury Romance and Jobber Scold has evaporated and you're suddenly down on solid earth because he's no longer in duo consciousness. He's no longer in two places at once, in New York and in England. He's just in England. Maybe what he should have done is write novels about America after that. But um, that seems to me the essence. Now, I've been told that um, I've got to shut up after a little while, but um, I must just um, elaborate a little on what I was saying about magical powers. Uh, in the early days of the Society for Psychical Research, um, there was quite a famous case, which is known as the Verity case. And what happened was that 
Um, a young student um, whose um, girlfriend lived in Kensington um, was thinking, he was reading a book about the powers of the mind, and when it suddenly struck him that it ought to be possible to make himself appear um, to his girlfriend. And so he says what he did was to concentrate extremely hard and that um, suddenly he found that he couldn't move, that he'd become frozen. Now, what happened between then and when, in fact, um, he suddenly was able to move again was that his girlfriend woke up in bed, saw him standing by the side of the bed and screamed and woke up, and then he disappeared. Now, he says that the next time um, his Miss Verity and her sister had by now moved to Kew, he made the attempt and wrote, um, as he did this concentration, I also put forth an effort which I cannot find words to describe. I was conscious of a mysterious influence of some sort permeating my body and had a distinct impression that I was exercising some force with which I had been hitherto unacquainted but which I can now at certain times set in motion. It seems fairly clear we've all got this power and it's been done again and again. Yeats also once was thinking, he says very intently, about a student to whom he'd been told to deliver a message and who was in France at the time. The student later said that Yates had walked up to him when he was in a crowd of people and said that he would return later. He did return later when the student was in his room and delivered the message. Yates had no knowledge whatever of this. And I bet you what you like that that is the way in which Poes did it. He probably knew that if he concentrated deeply enough um, in his state of innerness upon Theodore Dreiser, that Dreiser would see him. And probably he was rather surprised when the phone went and Dreiser said, how did you do it? Because that was the first time he knew that he'd done it. The funny thing is that this astral being, or whatever you want to call it, seems to be able um, to behave with autonomy. Um, in this second case, um, it actually went into the bedroom of um, Miss Verity and her sister who was sleeping in the same bed. It was the sister who woke up. Um, Beard, that was the name of the student, took her hand and actually touched her hair. So he must have been solid to some extent and then disappeared. It begins to look as if we all have some peculiar power which we can achieve if we sink deep enough into ourselves. A man called R. H. Ward wrote a book called A Drug Taker's Notes, which was about um, mainly taking LSD. But he also describes at the beginning of the book how once under dental gas, he'd experienced a kind of mystical sensation in which he said he suddenly experienced a reality which was realer than any reality he'd ever experienced during his life. And that in this peculiar state, he said, which probably only lasted a split second, but which seemed to go on for a long, long time, he said he found himself trying to think of a way of hanging on to what he'd seen in this vision. And that his only way of remembering what he'd seen was the formula within and within and within and within and within, going on indefinitely. That's um, mythologizing. Okay, I'll shut up. Thank you very much for this spellbinding lecture. I know there are going to be lots and lots of questions. We have ten minutes or so, I'm bored.
potency of the robotic self and the potency of the, the other self? No, I'm sorry, I didn't make that quite clear. In point of fact, of course, um, these uh, experiences of um, a sort of extraordinary ability happen when the robot and, so to speak, the real you combine and work together absolutely perfectly. William James says that um, a footballer might play the game technically very well and then suddenly one day the game takes over and plays him and it's then he can't do a thing wrong. Now these are the perfect moments in which, so to speak, the real you and the robot get together absolutely superbly and this is, um, this is what we're talking about. This is what um, Poes had discovered how to do by concentrating and focusing. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful talk. Um, I had a peak, peak experience, but, um, and I've also been on these things called Enlightenment Intensives, which you probably know about. I've done a hell of a lot of work on the Enlightenment Intensives and not had the peak experiences, but I've had, you know, had the peak experience for free, you know, just like that. But what's interesting is the, a lot of what you say seems to tie in with the Zen Buddhist thing about the uncensoring mind. And I try to practice the uncensoring mind, but it's like very, very tiring, isn't it? Because mm. you find, like, you, you can't draw boundaries, you know, because it's everything. Yes. <laughs> Do you find it tiring as well? Uh, well, uh, certainly, once when I was in um, a seminar at Sheepwash in Devon uh, with a whole group of people, and had given a talk on William James, oddly enough, we couldn't get away because there was deep snow on the ground. And we were all forced to stay there an extra day. And by the second day, we were all fed up and naturally wanted to get back to our homes, as this was over the new year, um, 1979. We finally all tried to get our cars out of the farmyard, uh, which was very difficult because the farmyard had a slope going up to the farm track. Mine was the only car that would do it. And uh, once I'd got onto the level, everybody pitched in, and there must have been as many people as there are here now, with spades. And we um, dug our way out to the farm track, out to the main road, which was sort of a mile away. And then I set out um, later, after I'd walked back for lunch, to drive home. Now, it was a very narrow country road, and I, know that if I, I knew that if I wasn't very careful, I'd end in the ditch. And this would have been a disaster. And so... I concentrated very, very hard as I drove along. And I concentrated like that for something like an hour and a half until I got out onto the main Exeter Road. I then discovered that I transformed my state of consciousness. And that suddenly I was seeing things in a, a completely, with a completely new kind of intensity. Everything I looked at was so deeply interesting that I wanted to keep on looking. It was almost as if everything I passed on the road, every cottage, every hedge, every tree, was trying to grab my eyes and pull them <laughs> backwards, so to speak, with deep intensity, deep interest. Um, and uh, this lasted, in fact, until I got home. And I did this once more on, once on a train going to Northampton to a, a publisher's meeting. And I actually went through Berkhamsted, where Graham Greene did his Russian roulette. And once again on that train, I succeeded just by sheer concentration in getting myself into the same state as before. These are the only two times in my life I've succeeded in doing it. But the funny thing was that although it lasted um, throughout that day and right through my lecture that evening, the next day when I tried to do it, it, it had gone completely. My brain felt as if it were made of old rags. No power left, whatever. J.K. Rowling does the <coughs> same. She talked about it on a train journey in order to write Harry Potter. She focused and concentrated quite intensively, and it all suddenly came to her. Well, that's very interesting. If You can do that by pure focus. She apparently did. Very interesting. I, I, I found it... It doesn't quite work that way with me. Years ago, I um, gave a friend of mine a, an idea for a novel called Spider World. And when he said he didn't much like it, said I'd write it with him. And so we began trying to write Spider World, chapter by chapter. I did it. But as soon as I began to write, suddenly something happened, and I took off like an aeroplane. And this would probably be my masterpiece. Um, when you ask kids a century from now, to the, have they heard of Colin Wilson? They'll say, Spider World, <laughs> in the way that they now say, The Lord of the Rings. And this was that experience, but it was, um, it was strange. It was being taken over. <laughs>
Who said that? It's one of the Apanishads. Oh. Uh, I'm desperately trying to mm. indicate it, so if anybody happens, <laughs> I should be delighted to... Oh, that is a very interesting one, yes. Isn't it? Fascinating. Had you thought possibly of having a seminar on the substance of what you were talking later on perhaps during the afternoon? Well, I've, I've occasionally done this kind of thing. I mean, yes. so many ideas are bubbling up. Um, mm. I feel it might be very fruitful if you if you've got any black. Mm. So yes, I would ask for a talk with that. Uh, Pat Dawson? Um, I was thinking, surely every baby and child uh, is capable of this. It, it's, it's, the, it's the world that's too much with us, isn't it? And, uh, um. uh, that's, I mean, that's the undoing of it. And Blake did this with his songs of innocence and so on. And the, 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 the better the artist, the closer to a child, Ah, but then you see, the child doesn't really have this robot, and the robot's so useful to us, that the reason that you find bad things so bad when you're a child is because you haven't got a robot to help you cope with them. And the thing that most children want to do is just to grow up. <laughs> and that's because they really instinctively want a robot. Um, well, what you can do, of course, is, um, as Wordsworth did in the Intimations Ode, um, you can, in fact, use your mind to conjure up other things and to think about it. And Wordsworth, after saying that he got himself into this totally gloomy state, ends by saying, um, and I again am strong, simply by thinking. A kindly, what is it, thought, a moment brought that thought relief, and I again am strong. It's this uh, use, the use of thought itself. I, I must emphasize that. By the way, I must tell you something very interesting that I did forget to mention and which I'd meant to. The most interesting modern psychologist after Maslow is a man called Pransky, George Pransky. And um, Pransky, in fact, learned all his things from an ordinary man called Sid Banks. And he heard that this Sid Banks was an ordinary kind of workman who'd received a revelation and that he now gave lectures about this. So Pransky, who was a psychologist who was becoming increasingly disappointed with Freud, went along to listen to Sid Banks and at first, I found it very difficult to understand precisely what he was saying, because Sid Banks appeared to be saying, your thought is everything. Everything is caused by your thought. And that therefore, um, if you um, have negative thinking, and this would appear to explain Theodore Boyce too, <laughs> if you ne have negative thinking, you're going to screw yourself up completely. But that it's terribly easy to get out of negative thinking. Uh, in other words, what he was saying was, you don't need a Russian roulette. You don't need any of these things. I mean, point of fact, you just recognize how far your thought itself um, is an instrument of total freedom. And as soon as Pransky really understood what Banks was saying, he said that everybody there, and they were all more or less people who knew Banks well and had heard him before, seemed extremely healthy. They all seemed copers. They all seemed on top of things, on top of their lives. And that this is what happened to Pransky. He suddenly got rid of his Freudianism and realized that curing people of neurosis is much simpler than he thought. But it needs to come in that moment of revelation. And what had happened to um, Sid Banks is this. Sid Banks was walking along um, with a friend and he was saying to this friend of his, you know, I feel so <coughs> unhappy. And his friend said, you are not unhappy, Sid, you just think you are. And he said, what? <laughs> 
And he said, then it suddenly hit him in a moment of revelation, and it's lasted him so that he's become one of the most famous teachers in America. Just that extremely simple recognition. And John Cooper wrote about ten books on this subject. And the, isn't it like um, the philosophical? The mind can save you. Mm. I've, I've never actually read the philosophical books, to be honest. Oh, for a very simple reason. Um, it would merely have been a kind of repetition of the hard work, you know, writing travel books. I've never seen why anybody writes travel books. I hate travel, and I hate travel books. And I imagine that Poe, being intensely subjective, felt exactly the same. And he would have said, do you want to rub my nose in this boredom of traveling around the States and looking at all these things? What I want is another world, a world inside me, not this world outside. And of course, I was joking when I said that he should have written about America in uh, Maiden Castle. He unfortunately um, didn't have anywhere uh, that represented for him uh, the kind of uh, flash of intensity that was represented by Dorset and uh, by Weymouth and so on. So the, uh, in a sense, once uh, he'd moved um, out to Blenau Festiniog, uh, he'd reached the end of his journey. Someone right at the back row now. Is that me? Yes. What you were saying about the Russian roulette and the um, firing squad made me think of the near-death experience and the return from the near-death experience with its enlightened perception of the gloriousness of life. Mm. And mm. that is always associated or often associated with a, a sense of moral goodness in the person who's experienced it. Yep. Does that work out in, in fiction and in John Cooper? Well, thinking very obviously of um, Tolstoy's death of Ivan Ilyich, which ends, if you remember, with um, his death and then suddenly, <coughs> as he goes into this state uh, of leaving his body, that there's no such thing as death. You see, um, I was always puzzled by the suicide of Arthur Kersler and the fact that he committed suicide with his wife Cynthia, whom um, I knew them both. And uh, I'm pretty sure that the reason Kersler committed suicide was that he was fairly sure that um, it wouldn't be the end. Uh, this is an interesting thing. When I started off writing about the paranormal, I didn't really accept the idea of life after death because um, it seemed to me not logical. Um, now I've written so much about it that I just have absolutely no single doubt that there is life after death. And uh, what you see when you come back from a near-death experience is this simple fact, uh, which is enough to produce, as it were, the ultimate peak experience. If only, you see, we could do that while we're alive and give a completely new meaning to our lives. That's what we're trying to do all the time. That's what the great poets are trying to do. That's what poets was trying to do. Uh, to bring down this sudden vision, this intensity of vision, so that you can actually live by it, as if it were a light, a searchlight, lighting up the rest of your life. Nearly everybody who's had uh, a near-death experience says, not only are they never afraid of death again, but they're never afraid of life again. Just one final question. One question too. Uh, in your books and in your lecture, you've always you've always made it a kind of active way of, of, searching, of searching for this peak. But my sense of John Cooper Poe's, and in fact Proust and Bonnard and a lot of other people who've made much of the moments of epiphany, is that they particularly privilege the way that it's involuntary. I mean, is that, mm. is that a problem? 
Um, not really. Um, <clears throat> I once said to Maslow, um, how can you have a peak experience? And Maslow said, you can't. They come when they want to, they go when they want to, and there's nothing you can do about it. And I said, but you know, that contradicts your whole philosophy um, of optimism, that there's nothing you can do about it whatsoever. But brooding on this later, I came to the conclusion that in point of fact, although it is impossible to have a peak experience when you want it, what you can do is to maintain the state of mind in which peak experiences are possible, that you can do, by keeping up an extremely high level of drive and optimism. And then the peak experiences come. The real problem is the pessimism that undermines us, the feeling that, you know, it's not really worth it. Right. Um, well, as Colin said, he was a speaker at our first conference in 1972. Very few other survivors of that conference here today. Tim, the Linda, <coughs> myself, and the <coughs> there. All oh, right, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and, uh, no more than a dozen. <laughs> On that occasion, we apparently disappointed Colin. He gave up in midstream. Uh, and we were very disappointed in turn because of this, but he has not disappointed us today. Uh, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>